I had a very profound answer where I asked myself the question that I hadn't asked since I was 14 years old, where I just asked, well, what if it's all just not true? And, uh, and oh my gosh, it's the most powerful spiritual experience of my life. I'm sure it wasn't audible, but it just said, of course, it isn't true. And it, uh, it set me back. In the year 2000, a little film by the name of God's Army hit the big screen. And this was the first time in movie history when a commercially produced, independently produced film that related to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, was available for mass viewing. Since then, there have been hundreds of Latter-day Saint-based movies that have been produced, and it's kind of evolved into a genre of films that's been dubbed Mormon cinema or LDS cinema. And the man who started it all, the director of God's Army, is Richard Dutcher. And I'm pleased to be talking with him today over Zoom. Richard, thanks for taking some time with me. Well, thanks, Rhett. Yeah, let's let's talk about this. This is a great subject. Somehow you got the title of you're the father of Mormon cinema. Yeah. And how have you felt about having that title over the years? Well, I, it was actually uh, Jeff Weiss of um, the Deseret News who first uh, who first slapped that title on me. And it, it kind of evolved. Actually, I think his the first time he said it, it was the godfather of Mormon cinema, uh, which I really liked because, you know, it has a little danger, a little mystery to it, a little power. <laughs> but right. uh, over the years, yeah, it's kind of become the the father of Mormon cinema. And uh, I, get, I get asked that a lot because uh, I think it's, it's great. I, you know, when I started this, when I, uh, I was an independent filmmaker in Los Angeles and a Latter-day Saint. And uh, it's all I really wanted to do actually was to be a filmmaker and, uh, and to be a man of God. That's kind of how I thought of it at the time. And I wanted to, you know, and, and so after a while in Hollywood trying to write and direct uh, uh, and uh, my first film was actually not, it was just a romantic comedy called Girl Crazy, another independent film. And uh, uh, it was just a, you know, a romantic comedy, a little bit naughty. I was trying to, you know, make a name for myself in the industry. And um, unfortunately, it was it was picked up. It was purchased by HBO and Cinemax. And it, it was like a five year process of of writing the script, raising the money, which took forever finally getting it shot on a minimal budget and then in a couple of years, you know, editing it and then trying to find somebody to distribute it. You know, if I'm going to put five years and everything I've got into a movie, I want it to be something that means something, you know, I was out on my patio barbecuing hamburgers and hot dogs for my kids. And, and I had the LA times spread it out because every Friday I, I would go to the LA times just to see what movies had opened and uh, that particular day, I was frustrated because I was looking at all these different new films that were coming out in the independent world specifically. And, you know, there was a, a new film for the uh, African-American audience. There's a new film for the gay audience. There's a new film for the Indian audience. There was just all the and and I was frustrated and I, I thought, well, why can't Mormons have their own film? I was, you know, very consciously and deliberately trying to create. Mormon cinema. I wanted there to be a cinema that that was, you know, vibrant and uh, that the the quality, the production qualities, and the quality of the writing and acting and directing, everything was, you know, um, elevated. So, you know, for Jeff Weiss to to say, you know, to say that I was the father of Mormon cinema was something I, I was very proud of and and still am to this day. So there was God's Army, which was received quite well with a very small budget, and then you went on to make two more. Latter-day Saint-based films. Uh, the following, yeah. you made Brigham City, right. which I've heard you say in previous interviews, people have described this as a murder mystery, but in your mind, you were creating a genre film, a, a spiritual drama, which is a right. genre that didn't really exist, but in your mind, this was like the beginning of a new genre you were trying to create. Right. But it's, right. but it, but to, to in, just to help people understand, it's kind of a murder mystery-esque kind of movie. 
Right. Yeah, that's but that's exactly it. It was like it had the dressings of a murder mystery, but it was really a spiritual drama. So, you know, spiritual drama first, murder mystery. That's even the wrong way of saying it, but you know, right. Maybe a psychological thriller, um, second or third. Uh, right. But yeah, I was I was pleased with how that that turned out. In 2005, you made States of Grace, which was a sequel to God's Army. Right. So you kind of have this trilogy of Mormon cinema films. Of the three, which is your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Well, actually, there's there's four. It's just that uh, the fourth is called Falling. And oh. I shot it at the same time as I shot States of Grace in Los Angeles. But then... Uh, um, I released it very on a very small scale in Salt Lake City and Los Angeles in 2007, and and then I never allowed it to be uh, distributed. I brought it out again for a, a tiny release, and I think it was 2011. Um, but it's just been in the vault since then. That's but right. it's my favorite, it's my favorite of all the films I've made. And uh, this is uh, the one that you advertised as the first R-rated Mormon film, right? Yes. Yes, I did. That yeah. was kind of just me poking, you know, I, I kind of like to poke at people. Yeah. Um, and at that time when that came out, I was pretty disgusted with what had happened to LDS cinema. So, uh, um, but of, of all of the four films, that was when I was finally able to, to merge my filmmaking passion and my, my religious passion, you know, I had a five or six years there where, I was in heaven, you know, because it was like my my spirituality would inform the filmmaking and the filmmaking itself, which was kind of searching and w was informing my my spirituality. And uh, man, that was ideal. Um, but as far as just, you know, your market focused, you know, I'm making this for the Mormon audience. I'm making this to do well. I think that just leads to a kind of a, a, a cowardice in filmmaking and uh, playing it safe. And, and I think, you know, that's one of the reasons LDS cinema is really um, never grown up is because, because of that, you know, because I don't, we don't have LDS filmmakers who are asking real questions who are like making real examinations of faith and, uh, you know, to this day, when I see films about Latter-day Saints, and I don't see very many because I get too depressed afterwards, um, I'm always disappointed by that. You know, it's like, man, what a great opportunity we had um, and what a great opportunity the Latter-day Saint community still has if they would embrace it. But but the filmmakers are just too timid. You know, I took that step out with God's Army, and to some extent that was playing it safe, but not really. I, I was surprised that uh, I, I think if you were to make that film today, the way it dealt with, you know, Blacks and the Priesthood and the anti-Mormon literature and the struggles with faith, and um, I don't think it would do well, as well, but uh, I think, but then with Brigham City, I tried to kind of, you know, go a little deeper, and uh, and if that had continued, which I, I, I tried to continue with States of Grace, you know, was even, I felt, you know, deeper um and more serious and then with falling which was you know the deepest of all but kind of a tragic film uh you know i i think that you know the audiences it, it, it could have grown it could have expanded but but what happened was as i'm sure people you know people who've been following this remember you know there was god's army and then i quickly made brigham city and that was out the very next year in 2001 and then i went off to Film about the life and murder of Joseph Smith. While I was doing that, all these other people who realized that, oh my gosh, there's a market for Mormon cinema. And that was my message when I made God's Army. I was speaking at colleges and everywhere I could speak on the news and everywhere. And I was really evangelical about, you know, um, you know, now we have a market where we can tell our stories and explore our faith. But all anybody heard was now there's a market. And so there was just this flood of people who, who didn't really have any reverence or passion for filmmaking. And as it turned out, you know, the films pretty much said this was they didn't really have a passion or a reverence for Mormonism. They were just, you know, trying to make a buck in this new market. 
and uh and you know so right after you know brigham city i think the next year was a singles ward which i despised because i in fact when i saw it i remember and i knew the filmmakers were making it and i was trying to support them and help them um but they really weren't interested in making a good film. They just wanted to make a movie, you know, they wanted to play movie maker. And, and uh, when I saw that film, I was so depressed. I walked out and I remember saying to somebody there at the theater, the Provo Cinemark, I said, I said, that's the first nail in the coffin of Mormon cinema. And, uh, and it really was, you know, and, and it's, it's success was unfortunate because it just gave those guys and other people like that an opportunity to make more. And to me, it was so offensive. You know, I was thinking, you know, um, I'd grown up since a little kid loving films and loving Mormonism and, and, and to me, and I was using the strongest language possible to try to help people see what was going on. But I said, look, this is, you know, singles word, the RM and that kind of stuff. That's like, you know, black people finally getting the opportunity to tell their own story. Instead, they they do cinematic minstrel shows. I mean, that's how I felt about it. You know, it's like people have been mocking Mormons and misrepresenting Mormons for since the you know since the beginning, since the early 1900s in cinema, and you guys are just you know doing that. You know, I, I hated it, and and. Uh, and I didn't really see what was going on because the Joseph Smith film didn't work out, but I had spent a few years trying to get it made. And by the time I came back with States of Grace, God's Army 2, which is how I marketed it at the beginning, because I thought that was a good thing. By then, the audience had been totally, you know, disappointed. And uh, because by that time, you know, several movies had come out and the LDS audience was kind of thinking, well, why would I go and pay $7 to go see one of these films, which weren't very good, when I could spend that seven dollars to go see, you know, Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings movie, and and I totally get that. Yeah. But, but yeah, I was I was not happy, and uh, and because I was so vocal, the other LDS filmmakers were not <laughs> happy with me. But uh, but I was right, you know, I was absolutely right, and I would love someday to see you know, serious, intelligent, well-crafted Latter-day Saint films emerge again, but everybody seems to me to be playing it safe still, which is too bad. In 2007, you, there was, it was publicly, widely published that you were distancing yourself from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and as of today, you're no longer a member of that church. I wanted to ask you, what was the reason you decided to leave? To be as brief as I, I possibly can, I spoke earlier about how my my filmmaking and my spiritual journey were just kind of intertwined and you know pushing each other forward wow. as I dealt more into more questions and and uh, um, and then one day in answer to prayer I had a very profound answer where I asked myself the question that I hadn't asked since I was fourteen years old where I just asked well what if it's all just not true. And, uh, and, oh my gosh, it's the most powerful spiritual experience of my life where there's a, you know, as a Latter-day Saint, you kind of expect something to come from outward, like a, an angel or, a, or whatever. But this was a voice that was, uh, that we're familiar with and talking where it was so clear, so powerful as if anybody in a 20 mile radius could hear it. But of course, I'm sure it wasn't audible, but it just said, of course, it isn't true. And it, uh, it set me back because it was it was the only way I can describe it was 30 seconds before I was, uh, I was all in a complete, you know, believer. I knew who I was and in comparison to God and who God was and what, what every, you know, what the universe was and where we all fit into it. And then 30 seconds later, uh, the only thing I knew was that God was real in a way that I didn't ever understand before. And that everything I believed wasn't true. And that was, uh, that was an incredibly difficult experience. Uh, people, I think most people hearing that would think, oh, well, at that point I would just be off on a, on another journey, but I was devastated and, you know, I wanted it to be true my whole life. You know, it, it was actually kind of terrifying because as I say, 30, in 30 seconds, I stepped into what 
a terrifying universe in a way where I just didn't didn't know anything. And and of course, I slowly realized, oh my gosh, this is going to change everything. And of course, I don't expect any Latter Day Saints to uh, agree with you know with my conclusions about that. But uh, but I would hope people would understand the or at least accept the sincerity that that I'm offering it because that's really really what happened from that in the years since then have you found a home in a particular religion now well for a, a long time um and again you know you'd think with someone having had the experience that i had knowing in a way that i could never deny that god is real um but I was so disillusioned and disappointed. And, and uh, so I was angry, actually, you know, it, it was, I mean, to me, I was thinking, why, you know, why would God put me through 30 years of this and let me be the father of Mormon cinema and just be so invested? And although I never lost faith in God, per se, I lost faith in my own ability to discern what was real and what, what wasn't in the sense that, that, uh, you know, if I had you know, believe this, if I had been all in for so many years, how could I trust anything, whether it was true or false, but just how could I trust myself to be able to discern that? So, so I, I spent a good 10 year, 10 or 12 years, just, uh, um, in a really cynical and, uh, kind of I, the way I describe it now is I was, uh, it was like a temper tantrum, basically pretty immature. It was around, uh, 2015 but i was i was uh <laughs> by this time to give you a little uh perspective you know i i was just a mess you know i was drinking way too much i was in a terrible relationship my marriage had ended after after i left mormonism and and uh, uh i was you know way heavy because i was just you know eating whatever i wanted drinking whatever i wanted doing whatever i wanted i was in a carl's jr downtown salt lake city and uh one night getting my triple bacon cheeseburger or whatever it was that I was getting. And there was a guy behind me in line and uh, he was huge. You know, he was like six feet, whatever, and, you know, big and looked kind of like a hell's angel uh, leader. And, and then he tapped me on the shoulder. And so I turned around and he goes, Hey, you're Richard Dutcher. And I, I denied it. You know, I said, no, I'm not. And he goes, yes, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. And then I could tell by his face. He's like, yeah, you are. I know because I've seen your films. I used to be Mormon. And then he started talking about being a pastor. And I started to notice that all these tattoos that he had were, were these Christian symbols. And I became instantly fascinated with this guy and uh, agreed to meet him for lunch. And then I liked him so much that I was just like, all right, I'm going to go see your little church Bible study, whatever it is, more to support him and just out of curiosity. And But being there, and uh, his little church was in a, in Murray, Utah, and it was uh, in a little industrial, you know, area where people were like welding across the way. And, and, uh, and it was just, you know, he'd go through verse by verse through the New Testament and, and teach. And, uh, and I just loved it. And it, it reinvigorated me to be like, I, and it was like, you know, I haven't really opened a Bible in 10 years. So I just dove in and, and started really studying the New Testament. And, uh, and that, that led me, you know, back into, uh, into a, a real faith. And, uh, and I still, I don't belong to any denomination. I'm just very passionate about, about the Bible, about the New Testament. And, and uh, so I actually, now I, I attend all kinds of different, you know, churches. Um but the only one that I attend really regularly is still that little Bible study in Murray, Utah. You know, Jesus is so much more real to me, is so much more uh, personal, more intimate. And uh, and religion now is so much less important to me as far as, you know, denominations and doctrines and everything. It's like I'm 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 devoted to the, you know, to the person um, of Jesus and to, you know, to the Jesus of the Bible, I guess, is the way people would say it. But but yeah, the relationship is just so much more intimate now. And that's something I never want to let go. You're involved in a project where you're doing another faith-based faith film, but yeah. it's this time it's not it's not pro-LDS. It's telling the story of a LDS missionary who was converted to, I believe, the Baptist faith. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I more of a, just a general evangelical, okay. um, faith. but, but yeah, he was an LDS missionary in, in Florida in 2005 and, uh, and became a born again Christian while he was a missionary. And of course, you know, that pretty much put an end to his mission and his life as a Latter-day Saint. And then he became a, he has a music ministry, had a music ministry. And uh, I was, I was fascinated by that story. It was interesting. I had no desire to really do more films that had anything to do with Mormonism, uh, pro or con. But when I saw his story in a little video clip on YouTube, I instantly knew it's like, oh my gosh, that's, I can tell that story. <laughs> so um it's but it's evolved now. since the interview it's it's no longer about his story because uh, uh there are multiple reasons but i i just decided to uh fictionalize the story so that it's not like based on a true story now it's uh um it's it's based on his story but also my story because as i was writing the script um i found you know so many things that i wanted to express and say and explore that that weren't a part of his story I have no interest in, you know, in making a negative film about Mormonism because still in a sense, they're my people and, and I love them. But, uh, and so it's more of a story about, you know, about that transformation from being a Latter-day Saint to a more of an evangelical style Christian. And I've never seen that story told before. So I want to tell it. <laughs> what's, what's the name of the film and when is it going to come out? Well, the name of the film is Jesus is Enough, and uh, I don't know when it's going to come out because I haven't succeeded in financing it yet. Um, so if anybody out there has a few million dollars and want to help me get this film made, yeah, just find me. <laughs> I wasted a lot of time, and I think a lot of, uh, of artists with faith waste a lot of time because they're trying to make something for the marketplace, and, and something I... I always tell younger aspiring filmmakers and writers and artists, I think that's the main message is people are always, you know, they're chasing, chasing the marketplace or popularity, which is totally understandable because they want to be able to make a living and continue to make art. But, but my feeling is, uh, and I'm living, you know, I'm trying to live my philosophy myself is, you know, whatever, What's the one, you know, I say, just imagine that you've only got 18 months to live and, uh, and you only have time for one project. And it's like, what's the one thing that you would want to leave behind for your children or grandchildren or just humanity in general? You know, what's that one thing? And that's the story you should be telling. That's the story you should be writing. That's the painting you should be painting, um, et cetera. And, you know, latter-day saint filmmakers out there or novelists or whatever same advice you know it's uh don't waste your time trying to trying to please the marketplace just just uh it's between you and god what's the what's the one thing you want to leave behind that's what you should be working on